think it stopped. Do you want to? There we go. Yeah, we're going to get her on the cloud. Thank you. There we go. Okay. So give me just one second and I will bring up my slides and we will uh, do some introductions. Excited for the. Uh, I had to think about what month it is. It's March. So the March JBS Journal Club. Um, today, we are thrilled to have two articles and the authors from one of those will be looking at perioperative outcomes of carotid endarterectomy and transfemoral and transcervical carotid artery stenting in radiation induced carotid lesions. And then we will also be looking at the article entitled Percutaneous Arteriovenous Fistula Creation with the uh, 4F Wavelength Indo AV System. Our um, hosts this, uh, this evening come from Atrium Health and also from UCSF. We're excited to have Dr. Charlie Briggs, who is the Associate Program Director for the Vascular Surgery Fellowship, and his first year fellow, Dr. Kate Keeley. And then of course, from UCSF, we have Dr. Shant Bartanian, who is an Associate Professor of Surgery, and Dr. Reem Elkura, who is also a first year fellow. From the articles that we have this evening, we have one or um, our two guests, the first author, uh, Paula Bartresh, and also Dr. Kolai, who is going to be able to field questions for us. And then we have two moderators. So Dr. Matt Smeds, who is professor of surgery at St. Louis University, and Dr. Tom Lindsay, who is professor of surgery at the University of Toronto. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, please stay muted. The moderators may call on you to ask a question if it's a little complicated, but please put your comments and questions in the chat. The event is being recorded for on-demand access and the April event has been scheduled for April 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. We have the dates for uh, May through August and those will be posted on the SBS website. So without further ado, I will turn it over. We will go ahead from there. Great, I will uh, begin the presentations. Um, and uh, <coughs> uh, first of all, let me thank everyone so much uh, for having us this evening. Uh, big thanks to Dr. Glavitsky, who I understand is on a plane, and uh, to Dr. Um, Dr. Lawrence, who's available as well, uh, to Dr. Humphreys and uh, Demuzio for having us, to Dr. Lindsay for serving as moderator, and to our authors, Dr. Batar. Uh, Paola Batarse and Dr. Uh, um, uh, my thing here is, hold on one sec. And Dr. Kole Lott uh, for publishing this paper and uh, to the SBS in general. So <clears throat> there is a uh, causal relationship of cervical radiation therapy uh, and the development of carotid artery stenosis. The interval from radiation to symptomatic vascular disease uh, can range from just a few months to up to two decades. Um, carotid stenosis following radiation for head and neck malignancy carries an increased stroke rate compared to carotid stenosis without a history of uh, radiation. Um, and severe carotid stenosis after previous cervical radiation is considered a high risk condition for revascularization. This all makes it a, uh, a challenge to, to manage clinically. And the reason for that is because uh, irradiated patients are typically younger uh, and may have the carotid burden uh, for a longer period of their lives. They also have a lower incidence of other risk factors, uh, typically except hyperlipidemia uh, for atherosclerosis compared to non-irradiated patients. Morphologically, these lesions uh, have a higher degree of stenosis and unfortunately, are likely to be longer and appear on non-typical atherosclerotic sites like the external carotid and the common carotid artery. Lesions in previously irradiated patients uh, may act differently as a disease entity compared to atherosclerotic induced stenosis. Uh, in fact, radiation induced carotid artery stenosis occurs uh, through a combination of direct vessel damage accelerated atherosclerosis, intimal proliferation, necrosis of the media, and periadventitial fibrosis, whereas uh, typical atherosclerotic cerebrovascular disease typically is uh, macrophage-induced uh, lipid core atherosclerotic plaque. Patients vary from 
uh, remote radiation alone to those who have had radiation combined with radical neck dissection and other adjunctive measures for malignancy, often making the anatomy, uh, quote unquote, hostile to further operation on that side of the neck. So these can be very difficult patients to treat. So uh, that being said, a thoughtfully conservative approach is typically recommended, particularly in asymptomatic patients. Uh, like I said, uh, many are younger and asymptomatic and have, and have a hostile neck. Uh, and so, it, you know, typically a conservative approach is recommended. Both carotid artery uh, stenting and CEA are the two major alternative treatment methods, uh, and they typically carry a low risk of cerebrovascular events, uh, though higher rates of cranial nerve injury and wound complications, uh, including infection, limit endarterectomy application in patients with prior radiation. Uh, further, uh, vessel wall architecture, architecture disruption um, may lead some uh, to prefer interposition bypass uh, as opposed to endarterectomy alone. Um, and then with regards to carotid artery stenting, patients have a higher rate of late cerebrovascular events and restenosis, um, even though those are largely asymptomatic they do cause a fair amount of anxiety, both for the patient and provider. So uh, Dr. Ecker in 2005 in Neurosurgical Focus predicted that as advancements are made in the technology and techniques for carotid artery angioplasty and stent placement, the safety and durability of treatments in patients with radiation-induced atherosclerotic disease will improve. And now we are 16 years later, and we have TCAR, transcarotid artery vascularization. And so if the future is here, how do we do? Well, in standard and high-risk patients uh, between TCAR and endarterectomy, there's no significant difference with rates of in-hospital stroke and death. And compared to transfemoral carotid artery stenting, transfemoral stenting is associated with a significantly higher odds ratio of in-hospital neurologic events, TIA, stroke, and death. So with that said, uh, let's hear how uh, TCAR does as compared to endarterectomy and, and transfemoral carotid artery stenting with regards to radiation-induced carotid artery lesions. This will be presented by my first-year fellow, Dr. Kate Kiley, who is a fantastic vascular fellow. She's at our Carolinas Medical Center program, and she's a graduate of the General Surgery Residency at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. All righty, I think we've got it up now. All right, so uh, good evening, everybody. As Dr. Briggs said, I'm uh, Dr. Kylie. I'm one of the, uh, uh, I'm a PGY6. I'm the first year vascular fellow at Carolinas Medical Center. And I'm really delighted to be here um, with you guys tonight. And I'm delighted to be alongside the UCSF team um, presenting their paper. Um, tonight, I'm going to be presenting the paper by Batarse and colleagues entitled Perioperative Outcomes of Carotid Endarterectomy and Transfemoral and Transcervical uh, Carotid Artery Stenting in Radiation-Induced Carotid Lesions. So um, just to sort of begin our discussion today, oops, I think I went to one too far. Um, it's worthwhile to sort of like back on what Dr. Briggs was saying to talk about uh, carotid revascularization as a uh, general surgical procedure. So as most of us know, uh, when it comes to carotid artery disease, uh, carotid endarterectomy remains really the gold standard of care for intervention for both asymptomatic and symptomatic patients who meet stenosis criteria. Carotid artery stenting was proposed as a minimally invasive alternative to open surgery in high-risk patients. Um, we all know about the PRESS trial, which looked at carotid endarterectomy against transfemoral carotid stenting. And that showed that carotid endarterectomy and carotid artery stenting um, have similar short and long-term outcomes, but that carotid endarterectomy had a lower risk of stroke in the perioperative period. And much of the stroke risk is believed to be due to wire manipulation across the aortic arch, as there was both um, uh, unilateral and contralateral um, stroke risk in those patients. And so this ultimately led to the emergence of TCAR as an alternative approach that sort of avoids the pitfalls of both procedures as Dr. Briggs spoke about. Um, it's a minimally invasive procedure with a small incision at the base of the neck, decreasing the risk of cranial nerve injury, and then use the stenting to treat the stenosis. Furthermore, the direct cervical approach avoids wire manipulation of the aortic arch in order to try to minimize that stroke risk. 
Um, and finally, it's important to note that whether we're talking about scenting from either a transcervical or transfemoral approach, um, because carotid endarterectomy has been uh, sort of the tried and true operative intervention, these stenting procedures are generally recommended as an alternative for patients who have an excessive risk for open surgery. One of those patients would be somebody who has had prior radiation to the head and neck. So we should talk a little bit about this, and this sort of just goes along with what Dr. Briggs already said. The ionizing effects of radiation used in the treatment of head and neck cancers causes arteritis of the vessels of the head and neck, and that can cause stenosis, thrombosis, fibrosis, as well as accelerated atherosclerotic lesions. And radiation-induced uh, lesions can affect long arterial segments, and they can be in atypical locations compared to atherosclerotic disease, such as within the common carotid. Furthermore, the radiation just doesn't affect the vessels, it also affects the skin and subcutaneous soft tissues, and so that results in dense fibrosis that can make operative exposure difficult. So then if radiation can affect both open exposure of the carotid and fibrosis and tortuosity makes stenting more difficult and maybe less effective, then the question remains, which really is the optical surgical approach to carotid revascularization in patients who have had radiation-induced disease? And so this study sought to sort of uh, elucidate that, that answer. Um, this study uh, looked at patients who had radiation-induced lesions who underwent either um, a TCAR, a transfemoral stent, or a carotid endarterectomy, and looked at their postoperative outcomes. So they found all patients in the SVS BQI carotid endarterectomy database who had underwent one of these three carotid interventions from the years 2003 to 2019. Uh, they excluded patients who were greater than 90 years old, those who had a history of a prior carotid intervention, and then also those who had a concomitant surgical intervention during their um, surgery, so for instance, a cabbage. The primary outcome was a composite outcome, and so that included postoperative death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. And then stroke included either a TIA, a, a frank cerebrovascular accident, or an ocular event. Secondary outcomes in the study included postoperative death, MI, and stroke individually, and also included cranial nerve injury and other local or systemic complications. So they identified 1,927 patients that they included in the study. 61% of those, or 1,172 patients, underwent carotid endarterectomy. 13% or 253 patients had a TCAR and 26% or 502 patients had transfemoral carotid scenting. Um, briefly, in terms of their demographics, the groups were pretty similar in terms of race. Um, they also had a similar past medical history of congestive heart failure and a similar BMI across the three groups. The carotid endarterectomy group had a higher rate of diabetes, hypertension, and peripheral vascular disease, but had lower rates of coronary artery disease. Compared with the TCAR and carotid endarterectomy groups, the patients who underwent transfemoral stenting were more likely to have had a symptomatic lesion, and then they were also more likely to have had a prior stroke. In terms of operative characteristics, um, patients who had a transfemoral stent were least likely to have received general anesthesia during their procedure. And carotid endarterectomy, as could be expected, was associated with a longer operative time than either TCAR or transfemoral carotid scenting. And so that was uh, 128 minutes versus 78.7 .7 for TCAR or 76.6 .6 for transfemoral scenting, and that was significant. In addition, distal embolic protection uh, was used in 96% of patients undergoing transfemoral scenting and 7% of patients undergoing TCAR. Conversely, um, flow, reversal was flow reversal was used in 4% of transfemoral scenting cases and 93% of TCAR uh, cases. Uh, for credit endarterectomy, uh, the shunting was performed in 52% of patients, 43% was because the surgeon uh, did routine shunting, 9% was for a preoperative or an intraoperative indication. Um, and intraoperative neuromonitoring was performed by stump pressure in 11% of patients and an EEG in 26% of patients.
So looking at outcomes, the composite outcome of death, MI, and stroke occurred in 3.2% of TCAR patients, 11% of transfemoral stenting patients, and 11.1% of carotid endorectomy patients. When broken down individually, the rates of individual perioperative neurologic events like the stroke TIA or an ocular event um, and of MI were similar across the procedures. Uh, the rate of death individually was lowest for TCAR. There was a trend towards a lower rate of crani cranial nerve injury in TCAR, but that was not statistically significant. And interestingly enough, two of the transfemoral stenting patients had a postoperative cranial nerve injury. There was no statistically significant difference in rates of wound infection across any of the three procedures. Finally, um, multivariable logistic regression of the composite endpoint was performed in order to try to adjust for confounding. Uh, no preference for any procedure was seen after controlling for the symptomatic status of the lesion, for hypertension, coronary artery disease, or diabetes for the individual outcomes. Um, and TCAR, again, appeared to exhibit the lowest odds ratio for the composite outcome. So what does this all mean and what can we, you know, use from this paper to adjust our practice patterns? Um, using this data from the BQI registry, this paper showed that TCAR is likely associated with reductions in the composite outcome of death, stroke, and MI. This is likely secondary to the unique characteristics of radiation-induced lesions as opposed to atherosclerotic lesions, um, as we said previously, as they are more fibrotic, more prone to thrombosis, and more likely to have embolic events. It's possible that early utilization of flow reversal in the TCAR technique before manipulation or transluminal engagement of the lesion can contribute to a reduction in this composite outcome. But it's important to note, however, that there was no significant difference seen in the individual outcomes of MI stroke or death on multivariable regression assessment. Because of the difference seen only in the composite outcome, it's possible that with a larger sample size and thus with in, uh, greater individual event rates that that might reveal a difference that we were not able to see in this study. Furthermore, um, this study is limited by the retrospective nature of the VQI registry and um, the limited data available. So there's some questions that still remain unanswered in this retrospective review. For instance, you know, why exactly was there a 0.9% incidence of cranial nerve injury in the transfemoral stenting patients? In conclusion, we can say a few things. Um, TCAR is certainly an attractive option in treating patients with radiation-induced carotid stenosis, um, although meticulous carotid endarterectomy is a tried and true operative technique. As we move forward and continue pr to pursue TCAR as a surgical option and we continue to refine TCAR techniques, um, additional comparative studies can be performed to evaluate the immediate and long-term post-operative outcomes um, particularly in patients with radiation-induced carotid stenosis, as this is a unique population of patients who require a unique approach to revascularizing their carotid. Any questions that we can answer? So um, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, and... Uh, um, Thank you for that excellent summary of the paper. Um, there were a couple things that I uh, that are in the chat, so maybe I'll just start with the questions in order. And um, if you look at, I think it's table three in the paper, it talks about the composite outcomes and then the individual outcomes. And if you look at the individual outcome of MI, a large number of the deaths um, seem to be associated with myocardial infarction. And Dr. Hingarani asks, um, uh, why was the death rate uh, in CEA and uh, transfemoral 8%? It seems high. And isn't this really responsible for the majority of the difference that was seen? Yeah, it certainly does appear to be the majority of the difference in this um, outcome. Um, although because of the retrospective nature, you know, as Dr. Hingrani says, it does seem particularly high in both carotid uh, endarterectomy and transfemoral stenting. Um, but because of the retrospective nature of the VQI database, it, we're not able to understand really why the mortality was so high in those patients. Yeah. Um, one of the things, uh, I, I might have missed it in the methods, but I 
uh, how is radiation therapy actually defined? Uh, was it just something that people checked off that the patient had previous cranial irradiation? Because I couldn't find that in the methods. Maybe one of the authors um, would be interesting, either uh, Paola or Isam might be interested in uh, giving us that information because I wasn't quite sure. I couldn't find it in the methods myself. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I can I can take that. There, there's a there's a field that just says uh, radiation lesion, if I remember correctly, like an indication. I see. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Lawrence uh, writes that uh, apparently in the April issue, which he's seen, but none of us have yet seen, <laughs> Dr. Mink writes uh, that uh, comparing carotid stents complications in early and midterm results uh, without radiation, and surprisingly, there was no difference in procedure complications or restenosis or reinterventions, uh, but the survival was lower in radiated patients. Um, it's interesting. Um, why do you think there might be a difference uh, between that and I assume this was a paper coming out of, uh, I don't think it was a VQI paper, was it Dr. Lawrence? Actually it was, mm. and it is online, but it was. So it's just looking at the difference between with carotid stenting between radiated and non-radiated patients. And it surprised me that there was no difference in, in as Trent, so I'm, that's why I brought it up because I think it's looking at a different issue, but really you have to question why there was no difference and it seems different than this paper. Yeah, is Sam any comments about that? Sorry, a little technical zoom glitch. Yeah, I, you know, that it is, it does seem high, and I'm I'm not sure why that is, and what's driving the mortality. Um, it, it's it's interesting that it's the same for CEA and transfemoral stenting, which is um, not necessarily what we've seen in bland atherosclerotic lesions. So I, I just, you know, I, I think my takeaway is that really there's there's sort of there's something going on here that is. Um, uh, really unmeasured um, in the in the VQI data, and I'm not I'm not exactly sure that uh, I can put my finger on it because if you say well maybe it's the general anesthesia you know the the uh, TCAR patients actually had a pretty high proportion of general anesthesia administered, um, so it, you know I'm I'm not quite sure I think statistically the mortality is driving the composite outcome I agree with that. But I just, um, I don't know that from this data, I can really with confidence say why and where it's coming from. Um, it'd be interesting to do something, um, you know, with the, uh, maybe with the Medicare match data um, in terms of a long-term type of analysis, because I think we can get, if I remember correctly, I think the Medicare match data does allow for, uh, for a cause of death. I may be wrong. Um, I haven't used the Medicare match data myself. All right. One other question that comes up is the use of embolic protection devices in TCAR. Um, now, you may not know this, but in Canada, <clears throat> the TCAR device is actually not for sale. It's not approved. Uh, but uh, uh, Matt Smeads asks, uh, I might have missed it, but what would be the indication for an embolic protection device uh, in TCAR? I think you said that 97% of the TCAR used flow reversal but seven percent didn't, and was that the seven percent that got an uh, that it got a protection device? Uh, you know, I, 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 I can't say. For, I'd have to go back and look at the data at the uh, you know at the observation level at the patient level to see if those two were in fact, you know, um, the ones that didn't get one were the same ones that got the other. Um, I, I'd love to say that this is just a data entry error. Um, but I think that the numbers are big enough that we can't just say that. Um, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure, uh, you know, because again, this is a limitation of, of the VQI data in that there's a variable that says embolic protection and, um, you know, flow reversal, and you just sort of check yes or no. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, I, I think this is definitely, 
you know, I don't know that any uh, that we'll ever get to a point where, you know, we'll have enough patients to do like a multi-center randomized trial. But I think that at the least this retrospective cohort is sort of hypothesis generating and that maybe we can start to look at this in multi-center retrospective, um, you know, chart level type of uh, reviews to better understand some of these questions and to better understand what's going on. The other issue is that uh, I think some of these patients were early in the TCAR experience. And I think that, you know, my, my feeling, um, and again, I'd have to go back and look at the data uh, more in more detail, but my feeling is that, you know, if we isolate it to the more recent TCAR experience, I think that we'll find closer to 100%, um, you know, more consistent with current practice in terms of rates of flow reversal and embolic protection and that sort of stuff. We try to exclude um, concomitant procedures. So I think somebody commented that maybe this was a, a proximal lesion or something like that. I, I don't think that's the case um, unless, you know, those few were miscoded and ended up in our analysis somehow. But um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of the other questions, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, Dr. Mike Conti notes that the true perioperative mortality rate for CEA or transfemoral was 8%, and it certainly would wipe out a benefit of almost any other, it would, it would, it would be hard pressed uh, to, um, uh, to uh, you know, account for that and for, to show that one, to, one was better than another. Um, uh, I guess final question, do you know if the patients had both radiation and surgery? Because obviously the radiated redo neck is even worse than just the radiated neck uh, for either carotid and arterectomy. Um, and I don't know if that's data is available in the VQI. No, I don't think, um, I, I don't know that offhand, but I don't think that that uh, is specifically available. Redo neck, um, I don't think is available unless it's, you know, we have the variable prior CEA on that side, uh, mm -hmm. but reoperative neck from other causes, whether it's thyroid, para, you know, uh, modified radical neck dissection, et cetera, I don't think that's available. All right. And Ed, Edward Gifford uh, points out that when we use the uh, code for TCAR, it still codes as carotid stenting with distal embolic protection, since flow reversal is not an option might be the reason why that got abstracted in the data that particular way. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, that's maybe a VQI-related uh, um, uh, entry uh, problem. So I'm not sure if Dr. Gifford's referring to coding it in terms of CPT coding for billing, because that would be correct. The CPT code is no different. Um, but, uh, but in terms of classifying it for the VQI, the uh, procedure type and the embolic protection system, whether it's um, you know filter or uh, or flow reversal, those should be two different variables that the abstractor can uh, input separately. Okay, but yes, I agree. There may be some confusion about that. Um, finally, maybe uh, medical therapy. Paul uh, writes that uh, Demuzo uh, writes that medical therapy today is better than it was 15 years ago, and and in fact, radiation therapy has changed quite a bit because uh, you know they're much more window in on fields now than they used to in the past. Um, uh, when most of the carotid uh, and arterectomy and and uh, and transfemoral stents, they may have been entered at a time when we really didn't have as good medical therapy because. This was between 2013 and I think uh, your data was what ended 2018, didn't it? I think 19, but yeah. But there, there certainly could be a difference in medical therapy uh, that's gone on over the period of time. Absolutely. And I would, uh, I, I was, <laughs> I don't know if I get to ask a question, but I was hoping to uh, pull the audience and see if people's approach uh, especially in the asymptomatic radiation-induced lesion is any different given that, you know, we think that strokes are caused um, by, by embolic phenomenon from carotid lesions. And these tend to be sort of uh, smoother, um, you know, types of lesions that just kind of develop stenosis over time. You know, do people treat the asymptomatic ones any differently? Do you, I, I remember one of my attendings in fellowship telling me that, that he was classically taught that all of these got infected, 
And so when I saw our infection rate in the study, I was very surprised that he was class. He told me he was classically taught that all these get infected. So he always used the vein patch instead of bovine. So, I mean, do, do people modify their technique or their perioperative management at all um, in the face of radiation as opposed to bland atherosclerosis? Uh, maybe if people want to raise their hands, if they do something different, uh, or, well, first of all, do, do people treat asymptomatic radiated carotids? Because they're certainly higher risk. You can raise your hand if you do and leave it down if you don't. How about that? It's hard for me to see everybody on the screen. It is. I don't think we have a lot of, of hands up right now, but it's... Um... It is an interesting question. I was sort of shocked by how many subjects in the study actually had carotid endarterectomy, and it was a higher percentage than I would have expected. Just, you know, that was the interesting part to me in some ways. But I wanna thank everybody for uh, a great conversation. Uh, in the interest of time, we do want to move into the, the next article so that we give uh, our next author group, or sorry, our next uh, presenters time to, to go over all of their work. And also thank you very much to um, Dr. Koleolait for being here to talk about the paper because it really provides insert, insight. So now we will turn it over to our colleagues at UCSF. Thanks, Ms. Dave. And a special thanks to the JVS Journal Club for the opportunity to review this paper. I'm Sean Bertagnan, Associate Professor um, at UCSF here with Reem El Khoury, one of our five plus two fellows. Um, I do have um, some relevant disclosures. I have a particular interest in innovations and in the nexus between diabetes, ESRD, and PAD. And as a result, I do have some intellectual property in the space that is assigned to UCSF. Um, however, I do not have any financial relationships for commercially available products, including the ones discussed um, today. Um, today, Reem is going to review a paper by Beathard et al. that describes the cumulative experience from a couple of pilot studies and a prospective post-market registry for a non-surgical technique for creating dialysis access, commonly known as a percutaneous AV fistula. Um, before Reem goes into great detail about the study and the interpretation of the results, um, I'll briefly review the technique and go over some relevant background information. Uh, while this is interesting to me personally, uh, more importantly, I thought it was a wonderful teaching opportunity to more broadly discuss um, how we should evaluate emerging technologies. Um, so the landscape of um, surgical devices is constantly evolving with seemingly endless new tools and procedures being presented at meetings and in publication. Uh, the Rovitz paper is a good exercise in assessing where early data comes from and in sorting out what information exactly do we need before introducing a new device or procedure into our daily practice. Um, so I'm just gonna propose a handful of big picture questions here to start. And what I hope the audience will do is to ask themselves these same questions as if we review this paper. First and foremost, uh, what problem is the new technology addressing? Is it a real problem or one that is perceived? Um, with experience, there are some claims that are obvious and can be taken at face value and others that are theoretical um, without clear evidence to support theory. Um, second, what is the standard of care that it's being compared against? As it is often the case with early human clinical data, these are single arm studies without a control group. As it is, it's difficult enough to make an apples to apples comparison, but at the very least, we should keep in mind a basic benchmark for performance of the gold standard, which in this case is a surgical AV fistula. Um, third, what are the endpoints that really matter? Uh, unfortunately, it's probably not the same ones in the graphical abstract at the start of the slide deck. Um, dialysis access studies in particular suffer from heterogeneous definitions, particularly for maturation, and lack standardized reporting guidelines for key endpoints. And finally, any changes to a complex system will have some unintended consequences. What other key stakeholders will be impacted by changes uh, if we make changes at our index operation? Um, so just as a little bit of a background, I'm sure, you know, very few people have actually seen one of these procedures. This is a little animation of, of what a percutaneous AV fistula looks like. Um, there are two devices uh, available um, in the U.S. And while superficially you might think they're sister products um, with closer inspection, they're actually quite different. Um, this paper focused on the miniaturized four French version of the wavelength device 
Um, uh, uh, and uh, here's a little animation. Um, <clears throat> the product was um, FDA approved in 2019. There's two catheters, an arterial venous catheter and an electrical surgical generator. And you can access, in this case, at the wrist with um, an arterial and venous catheter. This is the parallel configuration, or you can go integrate down the venous side. That's the anti-parallel co uh, configuration that accounted for a third of the patients. Um, these catheters are aligned with fluoroscopy. Magnets help the alignments, and current is run to create a fistula between the artery and the vein, typically the deep ulnar vein and the adjacent ulnar artery. And then it allows flow, as this animation shows, through a perforated branch into not just the superficial system, but the, you know, the deep system as well. So an important difference between a surgical and a percutaneous fistula is the um, distributed outflow. Um, the potential advantage here, obviously, is the patient experience without the pain of an incision uh, and potentially avoidance of wound complications. So to understand where this technology fits in, let's um, maybe just start at the beginning. What are our goals with dialysis access surgery? First and foremost, we want to safely and consistently interface the patient's circulation to the dialysis machine. The patient is there to get dialysis three days a week, not just to have a patent fistula. There are different ways in which uh, outcomes then are reported. The less stringent way, most basic, is patency, which can be derived by ultrasound. Um, but just because you have a patent fistula um, doesn't mean you've accomplished anything. Can the dialysis nurses actually cannulate that fistula and can they do it consistently? And so these are a series of really key endpoints here, um, going from less stringent to more stringent on um, how we assess a functional outcome. And functional patency is, I think, where most of the current studies go towards, and functional patency is defined as being able to use that fistula uh, in 75%, 75 of dialysis sessions over a four-week period of time. So a uh, much more stringent definition that really captures um, the essence of why we, we, we set out to create a fistula to get that patient on dialysis. Um, now, to get there, was our initial attempt successful? Um, it turns out there's lots of definitions for maturation and they're very uh, uh, heterogeneous. This paper is no exception and Reem will go into some detail about that. Um, but did we get there in one attempt or did we have to do multiple interventions in order to get this to work on dialysis? And that's the concept of unassisted maturation. So a patient was referred to you for dialysis access and you did a procedure, did it work? Or did you have to do two or three procedures in order to get them what they ultimately needed? Um, so what is our comparator? Is there a benchmark we can use? Well, this is probably the best available data um, that was recently published at a GM, GEMA surgery just a few uh, months ago um, out of the Hemodialysis Fistula Maturation Consortium. This was an NIH-sponsored um, uh, study of seven centers in the U.S. where they um, observed 600 patients longitudinally who underwent creation of a surgical AV fistula. And um, these are really great papers. I highly recommend um, all your local institutions um, read these as part of your own journal club. But if you had to take away, I think, two key um, uh, figures, it would probably be these two right here. Uh, one is the uh, proportion of patients that have um, maturation with a surgical AV fistula, that's the left panel. And you can see half the patients have unassisted maturation over a period of roughly three months, and then another quarter have assisted maturation shortly thereafter. So, you know, a surgical AV fistula is by no means perfect. A quarter of the patients will not achieve functional outcome, functional maturation, uh, but it's not awful either. Uh, and the second one is a question of quality and durability. And this is the idea of functional patency. And functional patency is if the patient is receiving dialysis, how long can you use that fistula before it needs to be abandoned? So that's not the same as doing a maintenance procedure or an angioplasty for a stenosis, uh, but really what is the functional lifespan of that access? And you can see um, this is what long-term data looks like. You know, 80% of patients have a functional patency of at least 18 months um, and uh, six-month endpoints or even three-month endpoints in this paper um, probably don't um, cut the cake in um, uh, making an assessment of um, durability. So back to the questions. Let's ask ourselves, what problem are we addressing today? What is the standard of care? And how does it stack up against that problem? Um, and what are the endpoints that really matter? Uh, so with that, uh, our spectacular first year fellow Reem is gonna take us through this paper.
Okay, hi. Um, so I'm Reem, I'm the first year ambassador fellow at UCSF, and tonight I'll be presenting the article entitled um, Percutaneous Arteriovenous Fistula Creation with the Four French Wavelink Endo AVF System by Berlin and all published in the March edition of the GBS. So um, endovascular has represented a paradigm shift in the treatment of vascular diseases. Percutaneous dialysis access presents the advantages of no incision and a theoretical reduced trauma to the outflow plane. Endo-AVF has so far shown favorable primary patency and secondary patency when compared with radiocephalic and brachiocephalic open arteriovenous fistula. Sorry. Uh, to date, the ellipsis and Everlink 6 French system have been tested with a reported maturation rate ranging from 52 to 93%. The previously Everlink, now Wavelink 4 French system was recently developed with the primary goal to enhance procedural safety in smaller vessel and to decrease procedural pain. As Dr. Vartanian mentioned, it recently received the CE trademark in 2017 and FDA approval for use in 2019. The purpose of this study was to assess the safety and effectiveness of this novel system. So in brief, the endo-AVF involved the cannulation of the vein and artery in a parallel or in a parallel fashion creating a fistula using radiofrequency energy. Procedural adjuncts include balloon angioplasty of the newly created AVF and embolization of the dominant brachial vein outflow. 120 patients were enrolled in the multicentric prospective single arm global study that was actually divided into two prospective studies and one post-market approval study. Inclusion and exclusion criteria were roughly similar uh, between the studies, and that was obtained on clinicaltrial.gov, was actually not mentioned in the manuscript. And these included patients that were either pre dialysis patients or already on dialysis, had at least one superficial outflow vein measuring more than 2.5 millimeters in diameter and in communication with the perforating vein, and an antecubital perforating vein measuring more than two millimeters in diameter. Sorry. Um, Primary endpoints of the safety and effectiveness study included procedural success and adverse events, while secondary endpoints related to cannulation and access patency. Maturation in this study was defined on duplex ultrasound as a flow rate more than 500 ml per minute and an access vessel diameter of more than four millimeters. And functional endpoints included functional cannulation that was defined as two needle access cannulation and at least two thirds of HD session lasting at least 120 minutes with a continuous 28 day period. Functional patency was defined as the interval of time from the first two needle access cannulation and HD access until an HD until access abandonment. The majority of this cohort was young with a low BMI and was already on dialysis prior to inclusion in the study. Procedural success was achieved in 96.7% of patients. Procedural time decreased over time to reach an average of 65 minutes. Device-related serious adverse events occurred in 2.5% of cases and procedure-related serious adverse events in 5.8% of cases. And these included a majority of occlusion and stenosis of, for up to 31%, wound infection in 4%, bleeding and hematoma in 4%, and pseudoaneurysm in 3.3%. Time to maturation was a median of 36 days. Time to successful cannulation was a median of 49 days. And in 69, 69 patients with six month functional patency data, 94% had undergone two needle cannulation at six months. Primary patency at six months was 72%. Assisted primary patency, 81%, and secondary patency, 88%. Freedom from reintervention for this time interval was 81%, and the majority of reinterventions occurred to assist maturation and included superficialization in 7% of cases and coiling in 4% of cases. The limitations of this study include in single arm. Uh, nature without a control group, uh, particularly with no comparison to the parent six French technology or open arteriovenous fistula, as well as a long term follow up. There was no data provided in terms of freedom from catheter based dialysis or time to catheter removal. 39 patients were excluded from the six month analysis with a potential for under reporting of technical failures. 
Moreover, there was no quality of life data, no um, comments on post-procedural pain or periprocedural pain. In conclusion, while this study confirmed the safety and effectiveness of the four French endo AVF system, it did not address its cost, learning curve, and impact or role in clinical practice. Furthermore, questions on AD access surgery definition remain. Great, uh, great presentation there. Thank you very much. Um, we do not have the authors on tonight, so this will just kind of be a, a, a general discussion. If anybody has any questions about this technology, feel free to put them in the box there. You know, I, um, I've i dabbled with uh, both uh, Wavelink and Ellipsis, um, and I, but I kind of struggle with um, when I should be doing these procedures. And so I wonder, uh, Dr. Vartanian, if your group is, is doing uh, either of these procedures, and if so, you know, what patients are you offering this to? Because I, I find it kind of difficult to, to pick because I can do a fistula with local uh, and MAC, uh, small incision very quickly, um, similar outcomes. And, and for me, it's been hard to, to select patients uh, for this procedure. Yeah, your, your um, on that? I, uh, I agree, Matt. Um, I mean, it's in my hands, it's a pretty narrow indication just because we talked about um, in this presentation, it um, ne hasn't necessarily reached equipoise with the surgical AV fistula. I think one of the issues is you really are creating a lower flow fistula than you typically see. Uh, and you have to do additional work down the line to get it to work properly. So the, the times that I found it um, at least palatable um, or let's say a patient that has had a previous Semino the upper arm vein is mature already, but the semino is, you know, beyond salvage as it included. It just needs a new anastomosis, similar to a turndown procedure. So that's one opportunity. Um, occasionally, I'll have a patient with a hostile antecubital anatomy, but with adequate venous anatomy. So a patient that had an abscess or a trauma in that location, but needs dialysis down the road. Uh, it's an easy way to create the fish flow without having to deal with um, a hostile exposure. Uh, rarely there'll be a patient on, you know, either immunosuppression or chemotherapy where wounds may be an issue. Rarely I'll have a patient with keloids who has some cosmetic concerns. Um, uh, um, low flow fistulas for, let's say, a plasmapheresis indication might be acceptable. Um, but we're really talking about a, a pretty narrow um, indication. Reem, I have a question for you. Sometimes the most interesting data is in the supplement. Um, it looked like there was a really high percentage of patients um, that were excluded from the analysis. Uh, and what looked like 22 patients that got excluded with non-functional fistulas. Is that right? Am I reading that correctly? Did the authors say, uh, or did they rationalize how they were able to exclude those patients from their um, analysis? Um, you're correct. So um, the rationale behind it uh, is in the results section under patient accountability. Unfortunately, the majority of these excluded patients had a failed access and there's, there are no data that were provided on um, their future uh, access solution or the need for further surgery. So that's, that's kind of a missing point of this, this article. So if we wanted to step back here and ask ourselves, okay, you had 120 patients in the ADA procedure, how many use that access for dialysis? So that's like your functional endpoint and the report on this endpoint. So we know there's 120 patients and 20 were CKD stage five. So you can't apply that endpoint. Uh, uh, then there's only 55 patients left that reached that endpoint, correct? Correct. So only, only about half of the patients got that stringent functional endpoint for cannulation. And um, you know, we, we know for surgically official, that number should probably be closer to 75%. Mind you, it's not a direct comparison, but that's just a, a ballpark of where they should be. You know, I wonder if the functional um, cannulation rate is lower in these patients because just by definition, their flow rates are lower. And so perhaps dialysis centers are, you know, less able to access these fistulas. You know, one of the benefits people talk about with, with percutaneous fistulas is, is they have a lower flow rate. And so the turbulent flow uh, minimizes um, outflow stenosis and this kind of stuff. And so, I, but I wonder if it's affecting, you know, cannulation rates in general from, uh, from the labs. You know, cannulation is very much a 
tactile function. It's an extension of the physical exam in the United States, right? So we don't use ultrasound to cannulate our fistulas. Um, the dialysis a nurse or technician has to see it or feel it in order to be able to put a needle into it. Uh, and you know that gets obviously more problematic when the patient is obese, but you need that feature in order to guide um, cannula placement. Uh, and so that's the trade-off. When you split the outflow or you have a low flow fistula, you're gonna lose that. And, it, uh, and so when we mention this unintended consequences, you, know, you have to work with um, a dialysis unit as well to accept a different way of cannulating uh, and be comfortable with that. So these decisions can't be made in isolation. You know, there's a lot of interesting discussion going on in the um, chat. And one was about uh, coiling of the, uh, one of the brachial veins which I've always thought was kind of icky. You know, Dr. Wong mentions that you can do that with impunity. And I wonder, would you, do you want to comment on that, Dr. Wong? And, um, you know, uh, on your use of, of uh, coil embolization and which patients you would do that in, which patients you wouldn't do that in, um, and how you're so confident that you can do it uh, with impunity. Thanks, Matt. I don't have an extensive experience with this, but the outflow you can usually see is via one of the paired brachial veins. You, when you do embolize it, it's actually um, just, um, I guess, downstream from the anastomosis. So it's not, it's not very far central in the arm. Um, so it's not really, I think, obstructing venous outflow from the arm or going to cause arm swelling or anything like that. There are some folks who might wait um, to see whether the fistula matures, and then if it doesn't look like it has come back, and coil the brachial vein later um, as a way of um, shunting more of that flow through the perforator and into the superficial system rather than wasting it uh, through the deep system. Um, but it may be an easier uh, coil target if it's still smaller and hasn't yet sucked up all of the outflow from that anastomosis is sort of my thought on it. Yeah, I think my understanding of the coil is it's not supposed to be 100% occlusive either. It's just supposed to kind of divert flow into um... Uh, you know, through that perforator in, into the superficial system. So you're not completely including the, uh, the outflow. Um, and then there's some other questions here about um, superficialization and arm circumference. Does that play any role in your selection of these patients, Dr. Bartanian or anybody else in the, in the chat that does these uh, procedures regularly? Um, do, you, do you shy away from this for pe with people who have large arms? Um, because, you know, obviously if you've have to do a superficialization that kind of defeats the purpose of doing a percutaneous fistula? Yeah, I mean, I mean, every, you know, I know some people do their superficializations differently, but I usually disconnect, retunnel, and create a new anastomosis. Um, uh, so, I mean, one potential use is, um, you know, and I've done this, I can't say it's worked spectacularly, but um, doing your first stage brachial basilic percutaneously just to get more vein, because you don't have to worry about that scarred part that you can't get, you might get a couple more centimeters. Um, and then it kind of, you know, avoids this issue of having to give up a, or coiling a, a deep vein because you're gonna transpose it anyways. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, again, if you're, if you're introducing more superficializations into your procedure or, or ligations or bandings that's as common for these, then I guess the question is, what did you accomplish in the first place? And should you just have started with a you know, traditional surgical procedure? You know, when I when I first saw these described, you know, several years ago, I kind of thought the the benefit of these might be in helping to increase the size of the veins prior to a person needing dialysis. So you do a percutaneous fistula, you mature up some suboptimal cephalic or basilic veins, and then you make a real surgical fistula down the road. But I haven't seen people talk about doing that. But that was one of the things I kind of thought about early on. Um, and then the, my only other comment about this paper is it seems to have a very low um, rate of interventions to both aid in maturation as well as to um, um, uh, you know help with secondary patency. You know our our group looked at our wavelength uh, series uh, a couple of years ago and we had a forty percent intervention rate basically to help in aid of maturation and to aid in secondary um, patency and so. I was curious um, as to your thoughts on their relatively low rate of, um, of interventions. I think they only reported something on the order of 19% or something like that with only half of those used to aid in maturation. Yeah, I think, you know, patient selection matters. So if you take young skinny patients that have four millimeter veins as, you know, some of the supplemental data shows that they did, 
Um, you're we're already working with patients that are easier to cannulate. And then if you work with your, and this is all speculation. Uh, and if you work with your dialysis unit to cannulate closer to the endocubital fossa, uh, you've got skilled nurses that can do that. That can certainly um, account for the observation. But, you know, uh, I think your observation is pretty similar to what else has been published, um, especially the post-market data um, for the other device. I mean, that's all I think um, uh, a pretty common observation. Well, great. I think um, I think that sums up the paper pretty nicely. Um, and I, I guess I'll refer back to Misty to close out the night. Or Paul. Before we do that, Paul is going to have one announcement. Yeah, th again, thank you all for being here and all the work to put this together. Um, here with us tonight um, is Gail Tang, one of the editorial uh, board members of the JVS, and uh, she's just going to share something for you all to look out for in the near future about um, VAM, if uh, hopefully many of you will be there. Gail, you got it? Yeah, so... Um... We are going to have a JVS uh, special session on Thursday at 1.30 at the VAM. It's going to be an audible bleeding podcast format. We're going to jump between different topics. There will be a panel answering questions, and then we'll have a special interview with the outgoing editor-in-chief, Dr. Klevitsky. Um, so the SVS is going to be setting up a Twitter feed. Um, to hopefully get people to uh, like or dislike uh, various questions and comments. And we'll also have a web form that you can submit if you have any questions or topics that you'd like covered during the session. Um, so we'll be promoting this in the next upcoming three months. So uh, please submit your questions and topics that are burning on your minds that you'd like to hear about from the JBS editorial uh, folks. Well, thank you. Thank you also for our um, hosts from UCSF and also from Atrium Health. Great conversation about really important topics that we're still struggling with every day. Um, our authors for being here and of course our special guests, Dr. Smeds and Dr. Lindsay for really helping us generate that great discussion. We will see you all in April and have a good night. Thank you, Misty. Absolutely. <laughs>